probably every one of you at one time or another has experienced uh, something at your doctor's office um, that uh, your doctor pulls out a little rubber hammer called a patellar hammer or a patellar uh, mallet and uh, they tap it uh, on your knees. Sometimes they'll do your ankles or, or your, uh, your elbows and, and they're testing reflexes. And so the most famous one is the one on your knee, you know, when they tap your knee and there's this involuntary response uh, from your lower leg that is, you don't think about it, you don't say, oh, this is what I need to do at this time. It's an automated response of your body because it is anticipating that something, if my knee's getting hit, I need to stable myself, I need to catch my balance, I need to do something to keep from wiping out. And so you don't have time to process all those thoughts. And so there's this instantaneous response. And the doctors, by the way that they can look at your response when they tap on your knee, they can tell what's happening with almost your entire central nervous system. They have a sense of what's going on, the way that your nerves are firing throughout your whole body, with this knee-jerk reaction that takes place. Now, you're probably also aware that a lot of times people use that phrase for a knee-jerk reaction for a lot more than just being at the doctor's office and then tapping uh, on the tendon, the patellar tendon just below your kneecap. We've come to understand that when we say that that was somebody's knee-jerk reaction to something, that it really is this. It's an immediate response to something. We, we don't even think about it. There's some kind of stimuli, and just immediately we say something, we do something without even thinking about it. Now, here's one of the things that's different about this compared to what a doctor does for you, okay? When, when the doctor is tapping on your knee and the way that your lower leg responds, you can't say to yourself, you know, I didn't really like that response of my lower leg. I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna do it a little bit differently. The next time the doctor tests me, I, my lower leg is gonna re respond a little bit differently. I, we, we don't have any say over that. But for this, outside of the, our physical bodies, when we have an emotional response to something, when we say something, do something, we do have the ability to reflect on that and say, I didn't like that response. That was not an appropriate response for me. And so I want to respond differently next time. Why did I say that? Why did I act that way? Why did I go here? Why did I do this? We have an opportunity to reflect on that and say, I want to do something different the next time. And this really fits in well to our praying. We've been talking about bold praying, praying bold prayers. And part of that idea of praying boldly is also praying long, and it's also praying quick, having more of an immediate response. I want you to see, we, we looked at this passage a little bit last week in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, where uh, the lead-in to where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, when he gives them this prayer, our Father in heaven, there's a lead-in to that. And if you'll notice, when you look through the verses, you will see this phrase that shows up there. It says, if you pray, do not be like, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't say that. It says, when you pray, not if you pray. Okay? Jesus is assuming that there already is a prayer going on. In fact, the verb tense that he uses there is really this. It's with an ing at the end of it. When you are praying, when you are praying. So he's not saying when something happens, this is what you're going to do. But when you are praying. And what he contrasts that with in these couple of verses here in Matthew chapter 6. Is he's saying these people might give it the title of prayer. They might label it as prayer, but they're not really praying. They're showing off. They're posturing. They're trying to make themselves look good. So what Jesus is really saying is here is when you're maintaining an ongoing dialogue with your father. Okay? When there is an ongoing conversation that's there, there is a relationship that's being developed. 
And now remember, this is the lead up to how he's going to teach us how to pray. Okay? When you are already in a conversation with him. And then we come to this verse, uh, verse number eight. He says, don't be like these them, those people that are posturing, those people that are trying to get recognized or be viewed as the super spiritual ones. So don't be like them. But your father, for your father already knows what you need before you ask him. He already knows what you need before you ask him. That's like our knee-jerk reaction then to say this. Why? My father already knows about that. Or maybe if it's an ongoing dialogue, maybe our words become something like, oh, father, you're already aware. When, when something comes up that you weren't expecting, you go to the mailbox and there's a bill there that you didn't think was coming. Something happens with your car. There's a relationship strain. Something that just, it comes out of the blue. Your boss announces, hey, we're having a major restructuring at work and your job might be on the line as a result of that. You know, something you weren't planning on because you were already praying, because you're already in this ongoing dialogue, then you're like, your knee-jerk reaction could be, oh, Father, you already knew this was coming. You already knew that bill was in the mail. You already knew my boss was going to make this announcement. You already knew that problem in my car. None of this has taken you by surprise. So what's my knee-jerk response going to be then? I'm just going to continue my dialogue with him. Okay? So this is how we can test ourselves. I said we can't do it in our physical body. When the, when the doctor's tapping on our knee, we can't say, oh, I want to change how my leg is responding there. But we can certainly do it ourselves. When troubles appear, there's two questions we have to ask ourselves. Who's the first one that I run to? Who's the first one that I run to? Or what's the first thing that I do? When that bill comes in the mail, is my first response to check the balance in my bank account? When a problem comes up, is my first thing to run to tell somebody about it and say, hey, why, why did this person say this to me? Why did they respond this way? You, do you think that this is the one? Is that my first response? Now, we have, a, we have an opportunity to self-reflect. When troubles appear, where am I going first? What am I doing first? What's my knee-jerk response to those troubles? And if we don't like the response, if we, don't, if we say something like, yeah, I do normally run to you know, get on my phone and, or my computer and I check what the balance is in my account. I start doing all the calculations, like, can I pay this bill? Can I, you know, or do I run to somebody and say, hey, I need help on this? Or is my response, Father, you already know about this. I like what Oswald Chambers reminds us. Prayer is not only asking, it's an attitude of heart that produces an atmosphere in which the asking is perfectly natural. Because I'm already in this dialogue. In other words, I'm not just showing up to talk to God because a problem just took place, because something just popped up that I wasn't expecting, but there's this attitude, there's this atmosphere where I'm just already in this dialogue. And so then I just say, oh, I wasn't expecting this problem, but Father, you were already there. You already knew about it. Give me guidance. Is there somebody I'm supposed to talk to? Is there a bank account I'm supposed to check? Is, what am I supposed to do here? There, you're already, it's just natural. You're already in that atmosphere where that dialogue continues. Now I want you to see this lived out in the life of the early church in Acts chapter 4. If, you, uh, if you're following along with your Bible, I know if you have the printouts, you got both verses right there. But if you're following along with your Bible, please keep your finger in that uh, Matthew chapter 6. Because I want to show you some back and forth between the two of those in a second. Let me set the stage here of what ha what's happening in Acts chapter 4. If we back up to Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to the temple, and there is a man that's sitting outside the temple. He's lame, he's crippled, he's been this way since birth, which means that every day somebody is carrying him and plopping him down outside there so that he can beg for money. This is his only way of supporting himself, is that hopefully... There's some people that as they're going into worship, they are predisposed to do some good deeds. And so they might drop some money into his cup as they're going in. And on this particular day in Acts chapter 3, 
This is not very long after Jesus has ascended back into heaven and the first church has been born. As they're walking in there, Peter and John notice this man. And the man notices them, noticing him. And so he's looking at him, kind of like with his cup, like expecting he's going to get something. And Peter looks right at him and says, I don't have any money. I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. But here's what I do have in the name of Jesus rise and walk and he takes the man by the hand and he lifts him up and immediately strength returns to his legs whatever was out of alignment in his legs is put back into alignment and he can now walk in fact he doesn't go from just like a toddler learning how to walk he immediately goes to leaping and dancing and twirling around everybody in the place it obviously gets their attention they're like that's the guy that sat out there for years and years and years This guy is bouncing around, but he's hanging on to Peter and John. He doesn't want to let go of them. And a crowd gathers. And Peter, once he has an opportunity, now everybody's surrounding him, he says to the crowd, why are you surprised by this? This is the normal (coughs) operation of what Jesus does. This is how Jesus operates. He comes to bring wholeness and life to people. And he says, so let me explain what's going on here. And he preaches a sermon that results... In 2,000 people making a decision to follow Jesus as their Savior. The religious leaders hear about the commotion in the temple, and they send their guards up there, who immediately seize Peter and John, take them without any questions, without any uh, inquiry into what's going on. They just throw them into prison. And Peter and John sit in prison all night. The next day, as the religious leadership gathers, they bring Peter and John before them and say, can you give us an account of what's going on? And Peter preaches really just a kind of a continuation of his sermon in front that he was preaching in the temple. At the end, these guys send Peter and John away with this warning. We don't want you to talk about Jesus anymore. Now I want you to understand, Peter's response is a bold one. He says, are we supposed to obey you or are we supposed to obey God? And that's, that's his response. I don't have to, you know, you're men saying this, but God's told me to preach. But let's, let's just understand for a second, this is not an idle threat. This group of people that are warning them not to preach anymore, and they don't finish the sentence, they're just kind of like, don't do this anymore or else. This is the same group of people that convinced Pilate to crucify Jesus. So this is not an empty threat. This is not like, well, if you continue doing this, we're going to give you a slap on the wrist. If you continue doing this, you could very well find yourself in the same situation that Jesus was in just a few months ago. And we're going to do the same thing to you that we did to him. So Peter and John come back to their brothers and sisters. They come back to the church and look at their knee-jerk response. Verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they immediately started a petition to circulate around among their neighbors. Oh, no, they didn't do that. That wasn't their knee-jerk response. When they heard this, they immediately raised their voices together in prayer to God. Their knee-jerk response, not hey, uh, let's get a council together and decide what are we supposed to do? Should we make some kind of a preemptive move? Let's write a letter. Let's send a delegation and go to Pilate and talk to him. Or let's go to King Herod and talk to him and try to smooth things out before this gets out of control. Or maybe we should decide to just like, well, Jerusalem's not going to work. Let's get out of here. Let's go somewhere else. Let's, you know, that the, the threat is not as intense. They didn't have any kind of counsel, any kind of decision. There's not even a prayer request. There's not even like, okay, so what I would like us to pray for is, but there's this immediate knee-jerk response to prayer. And what I love about this is that the words that Luke uses here, very specifically, very carefully, as directed by the Holy Spirit, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. The words there imply that this was a unified response. Some translations even say that they prayed with one mind or with one attitude. So there wasn't this idea of like, um, I think we should pray that God 
rains down lightning bolts. I think what we should pray for, I think we should pray. They, there wasn't all of this like different discussion of what they should pray for. They already had one mind on the subject and they just began to pray. <clears throat> the other thing I love about this is the word there for uh, raise or some translations say lift their voices. The same, the, the idea of lifting there is this is a burden that is too heavy for us I need to lift it to someone else who can carry it. Peter, who's right here, a part of this group praying, he writes later on to the, first, to the church in his first letter, he says, take all of your cares and anxieties, lift them up and cast them on Jesus because he cares for you. That's the same thought here. This is weighing us down. This is too big of a burden for us to shoulder. We have to give it to somebody else. We have to give it to God. And... Not only that, but when they raise their voices together, that phrase, voices together, one Greek scholar commented on there the, that this has a musical connotation to it, that the thought is that this is a crescendo of not only voices, but even musical instruments as well, that this is like leading up to kind of that, that final conclusion, you know, maybe when you're uh, watching an orchestra play or you're listening to the soundtrack of a movie and, you know, the action is, is intensifying and the music is building, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, you can picture that musical director, that you know, orchestra director, ah, you know, and, and the voices and all the instruments just explode in this crescendo. That's what it is here. This wasn't, you know, one of these kind of prayers, okay? This was lifting their voices, one mind, one heart, one attitude, this crescendo of prayer that gets lifted up to God. And look at their prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracle, miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I love this prayer. This is a, just a phenomenal knee-jerk response to what they're facing that looks like overwhelming odds. I mean, this church has just been born. They're just getting their footing. They're just getting going. And you'd almost like to say, you know, God, could you give us maybe a, some smaller challenges that we could kind of ramp up to a little bit? Why are you giving us something that is so seemingly overwhelming? I mean, these are people that have the authority to just without anything else, you know, going to anybody else, they can excommunicate us. They can completely cut us off from the rest of the Jewish community. But then they also have shown that they can twist Pilate around their finger and they can get him to do what they want him to do, we could end up like Jesus on crosses. We could be dead as well. And they, they're facing these overwhelming odds. I like this quote from Mark Batterson. Maybe God allows the odds to be stacked against us so he can reveal more of his glory. Too often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our lives. We want everything in our favor, but maybe God wants to stack the odds against us so we can experience a miracle of divine proportions. Maybe faith is trusting God no matter how impossible the odds are. Maybe our impossible situations are opportunities to experience a new dimension of God's glory. I believe that. And if our response, if our knee jerk response would be, God, I can't handle this, you handle this, and we respond the way that the church did, I think that God does receive all the glory. Now I want you to see two things in this prayer. The first thing that I want you to see is the parallels between this prayer and the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray and taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. Now I told you last week, 
when Jesus said pray this way, in the context of what he had just said about people just repeating phrases, he didn't say, if you say these words in this order, this becomes the magical formula prayer. If you pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and you pray these, prayer, these words just like it is, that's kind of the magic bullet. That's the one that will fix everything. He gave us this prayer as a template to pray our own prayers for our own situations, our own circumstances that we're in. And I want you to see how the church in Acts chapter 4 really used this template prayer, this model prayer that Jesus gives us as they pray here as well. So look over here, and you can follow along in your scripture as well. So Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven. <laughs> we acknowledge that he is in control. The very first thing that the church prays is sovereign Lord. You are the king over all kings. You are the God over all gods. There is nobody that is your equal. There is nobody that is your rival. You are sovereign, which means you decide what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. You are in a category all by yourself. Our Father in heaven, our sovereign Lord. Then we pray, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Look what they, they pray here. God, you're not only the sovereign Lord, but everything that we see around us, you made it. You made the heavens, you made the earth, you made the sea, you made everything that's in the heavens, everything that's on the earth, everything that's in the sea. Your name gets exalted because your name is the one that created everything and sustains everything. It all works according to the way that you designed for it to work. Your name is hallowed. Your name is set apart. Your glory is what is preeminent here. Then Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Notice what they said here. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And they quote from Psalm chapter 2. They quote words that were written about a thousand years before where they were sitting right now. This is written about a thousand BC that David is writing Psalm chapter 2. But now look what they say happens here. They said, this is what David said. And then in the next verse, they said, indeed, here's what Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles, so that'd be the, the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leadership, here's what they did. But notice in verse number 28, what they declare here is that they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Your kingdom is coming. Your will is being done here on earth exactly as you want it to be done. You already spoke it through the mouth of David a thousand years before that, that there, the kings and rulers were going to line up against your anointed one. They were going to rage against your anointed one. They were going to try to take out all of their frustrations against your anointed one. And lo and behold, a thousand years later, right here in Jerusalem, we saw this very thing happen. The Jewish leadership went to Pontius Pilate, and he joined forces with Herod, and then they turned Jesus over to the Roman centurions to have him crucified. It happened just like you said. And so in other words, like we said before, when you pray and you acknowledge that your father already knows, you say, oh, God, you, you were already aware of this. That's what they're saying right here. God, when did this happen to Jesus? You weren't perplexed by this. You weren't going, hey, what's going on here? I didn't see this coming. You already decided ahead of time that this was how it's going to happen. Your kingdom is coming. Your will is being done right here. It's unfolding right before us. Now, look at the next uh, part of the, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. They said in here, forgive us, uh, forgive their threats. And it really the implication there is their empty threats. Now they weren't, remember I said, they, they had the power to make life miserable for them. But they said, in light of the fact that you're already in charge of everything, it doesn't really matter what they threaten. They can't change your plan. But that being said, you know, it's pretty natural for humans when somebody says something bad about you or to you, our natural response is to bounce it right back at them. Well, yeah, well, you too, right? 
Now, we don't see Peter and John saying that, but I think that when they came to the church and they started saying, hey, guys, we just got hauled in, that we spent a night in prison, and then this is what they said, I think that there were some people in the room that were going, yeah, well, I'm going to... I think that there was a little bit of that bounce back, and they said, no, hold on a second, God, forgive us for thinking that way. Those are empty threats. Why, why do we have to... And again, Peter, in his first letter to the church, he says to us, when people revile you because you're standing up for Jesus... Do it like Jesus did. He didn't return insult for insult. He didn't trade insult for insult with these people. He turned it over to God. In fact, what did Jesus say as he hung on the cross, looking at those people that had just driven the spikes through his wrists and his ankles? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I think when they're, when they're saying here, consider their empty threats, they're also saying, consider our response. It might not have been very appropriate, but Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're empty threats that they're trying to make against you. What can they do against you to try to stop you? So let there be forgiveness that's there. Then Jesus said that we pray to give us every day our daily bread. Friends, this is where we can head off a lot of anxiety because we begin to look at tomorrow and next week and next month. And Jesus said, keep your thoughts right here. Pray for this. Give us today our daily bread. God provide. And, and that's where we need to guard our thoughts when they start running ahead. When they start getting to, okay, yeah, I made it through today. Well, what about tomorrow? You know what? Tomorrow you say, oh, my father's still there. He's, he's still there. He, he knows what I'm going to need tomorrow. And so they prayed in this prayer in Acts chapter 4, God enable us today to be able to respond to this threat the right way. And then finally, the last part of the prayer, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So God, not only enable us to respond the right way, but we want to see your power. We, we don't want to give in to the temptation to run away. We don't want to give in to the temptation to try to trade insult for insult. We don't want to try to give up into any of those worldly temptations. But instead, God, what we want you to do is we want you to stretch out your hand. Look what he says here. Stretch out your hand, heal, perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We want to see your power displayed in a way that confirms that what we're doing is your word, that what you, is what you're saying. Now, look at uh, another thing I want you to see in this prayer. Not only are they following this template that, that Jesus gave them, but notice how they went to Scripture. They went to the, in the first part of their prayer. They immediately go to God's word. They go, they say, Holy Spirit, you said this through David. And here's what we're going to stand upon. I've said this to you before, and, and it's, it's worth repeating. The Bible is not a book just for us to read through. A Bible is a book for us to pray through. Amen. This informs our prayers. And it's a double-edged sword because the more we read God's word, the more effective our prayers are going to be. And the more effective we, we pray, the more we're going to get out of reading God's word. It's this cycle that's going to fuel itself. But notice what they said, not because we have any authority, not because we're smart, but because, God, this is what you already said, and this is the promise that we're going to stand on. We're going to stand on your word. We're going to stand on what you already said. And so they take this passage of Scripture that although it was written a thousand years before, they said it still applies today. And friends, this is what we need to do in our prayer time as well. This is, needs to become part of our knee-jerk response, our unthinking, automatic response. When the problems come up, what does God say about it, and how can I turn that into prayer? What's his promise that I can stand on, and how do I pray that this becomes part of my daily bread, this becomes a part of God's kingdom, and his will being done here on earth as it is in heaven, that it's bringing glory and honor to his name. Not me running around getting the glory because I'm doing something, but you're getting the glory because you're showing your power. So find God's word, find that promise, 
and then use the template that Jesus gave us to turn it into a prayer that you can stand on. Make that your knee-jerk response. It's what Jesus wants us to do. He doesn't want us to live lives that are just barely eking it out, just barely making it by. He said this, I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Paul really echoes that same idea in Ephesians chapter 3 when he's really, this is, he's telling us how we should pray. Now to him who by and in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose, your, your kingdom come, your will be done, carry out his purpose and do it super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and forever. In week one of this series, I, I made the statement that I think that our prayers, for the most part, are too timid. I think God wants to do more miraculous things than we're willing to ask him to do. I think that we hold back and we don't see that here. We don't see that in this knee-jerk response prayer from the first church. They weren't just like, well, I guess we're going to get persecuted. So just give us the strength to be able to just make it through. That's, that's not the prayer that they're praying. And they're not praying, God, take the trouble away. Just blast these guys so that they're not even around to cause trouble anymore. They just said, hey, we, we believe you can do super abundantly. You can do far beyond what we can even imagine or think. So enable us to be bold and then God stretch forth their hand and do all these miraculous signs that confirm that we're speaking the bold word that you've told us to speak. So here's what I want you to reflect on. What is your knee-jerk response to the troubles that come along? What's your immediate, unthinking response when something happens? It's an easy question to ask, but I think it's also it's an easy answer to change if you don't like it. If you say, after you've gone through a situation, you go, okay, how did I handle that? Why was my first response to go do this, talk to this person, check this out, think about this, try to finagle this, try to work this out. And then when none of those things worked, then I went to pray. Why, why, why was prayer my last resort and not my first response? That's, we, we can make those changes. Can't do it in our body when the doctor's hitting, it, hitting our knee with his mallet and go, yeah, I don't really like my response in my life. But we can do it with our emotional response our spiritual response, we can say, why did I respond the way that I did? And then do it differently. Say, God, you already knew. This problem, it's taken me by surprise. It blindsided me. I didn't see it coming. But Father, you already knew about this. Before I am even asking you, before I'm even talking to you about it, you already knew about it. So God, what's your promise? What does your word say? Show me something in the scripture that I can stand on your word. And then let me turn that into a prayer. And, and Jesus gave us the template. He gave us the model that you could pray and, and use that promise. Put that promise into that prayer and pray it again and again and again and again. Stand on that promise. Let this be your immediate response. Not your last resort, but your first response. When troubles come along. That's, I think, what keeps our prayers bold and keeps them persevering and brings glory to God because he gets all the glory for it. Not me. I didn't do anything. He's doing it all because I'm pushing it all on him. I can't carry this. God, you get all of this. Let's bow in a word of prayer this morning, shall we? Just before I pray for us, would you just take a moment just in the quietness with just you and the Holy Spirit and just ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Without condemnation, he doesn't condemn, but the last time that something caught you by surprise, something came up out of the blue, you weren't expecting that response, that bill, that problem, that whatever. What was your knee-jerk response? What did, what did you do?
And if that response wasn't to say, Father, you're already aware of this. My Father in heaven already knows what I need before this problem even came up. That's a change that you can make. You can ask the Holy Spirit to remind you the next time that that problem comes up, I want my first response, my knee-jerk reaction to be prayer. Find the promise. Stand on the promise. Pray the promise. And watch and see God be glorified. Lord, I pray that you'd help my friends. Help me. Help all of us. God, that we can respond in a way that brings you glory. When a problem comes along in our individual lives, that our knee-jerk response is to say, Father, you already knew about this. And here's the promise that I'm standing on. Here's how I'm going to pray, believing for your glory to be displayed in this. If a problem comes along and affects us corporately, the whole church, like it did here in Acts chapter 4, may we respond the same way. May there be an immediate and a unified lifting of our voices, a chorus, a symphony of prayer that's lifted up to you. As we stand on your word, we stand on your promises, and we pray with boldness, believing that you're going to do exceedingly abundantly, super abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or think or imagine, so that your glory is revealed in ways to lift you up, bring other people to a knowledge of you as their Savior. God, we understand our first response can be a great testimony. But everybody around us is ducking and running for cover. And we stand firm, knowing that our Heavenly Father already has the situation in control. People will notice that. And it'll be a great opportunity for us to be able to tell them about your love. So help us do that, God. Help us respond in a way that brings you all of the glory and the honor. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> I love you, friends. Thanks for being here today. Think about your knee-jerk response to those troubles. Correct it if you need to. Pray boldly. I love you. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.